meet my colleagues, Nate and Zach. They take running pretty seriously. Why do I run? I mean, I run because I enjoy pushing myself to my limits and trying to figure out what those limits are. For the past few years, I've been doing ultra marathons. It allows me to, you know, kind of clear my head and think. Yeah, man, I mean, when it comes to ultra running and long distance running, I mean, I mean do your thing. You know, it's not going to be me. <laughs> now, I'm not a runner, but Zach, Nate, and I do share a passion for biology. For the past three years, we've been studying how a mouse of all animals has evolved to become one of the most extreme endurance athletes on the planet. All right, so the deer mouse, Paramiscus maniculatus, has the widest elevational distribution of any North American mammal, right? So it occurs on the floor of Death Valley, below sea level, all the way to the summits of the highest peaks out west and everywhere in between. If you think about the tops of mountains, some of the most extreme environments on the planet, right? so you're talking about you know, extremely cold, very windy environments with very little oxygen. Many mammals that live on mountaintops will ride out the winter by hibernating. Deer mice don't do that, so they're active all winter long, buried by feet of ice and snow. Staying warm and active during cold winters requires a lot of energy. So we wondered, how do the mice on mountaintops fuel their activities? The first step to answering these questions is catching mice. Uh, so we're out catching uh, deer mice. We use these traps, they're called Sherman traps. And you can see there's a little trap door that you put down and there's a tiny little catch inside. Inside there you put in uh, a little treat. And then as soon as a mouse gets a whiff of that and they cross that threshold, it closes shut. And then you wake up in the morning and you have a little friend waiting for you. During a night you can put out hundreds of traps. Depending on the site, sometimes you may only catch like two or three mice. Oh, hey guys, looks like we got one here. It's kind of like having a little Christmas present when you wake up. Oh yeah, cool. So what's the total now? We capture mice from low elevation habitats, which we call lowlanders, and the tallest mountains, which we call highlanders. We then take them back to our lab at the University of Montana to collect data on their metabolism and genetics. Lowlanders and highlanders live in very different environments, and both groups use energy to find food and mates, avoid predators, and stay warm. For the mice, like all animals, that energy comes from the food they eat. Food provides metabolic fuel that animals transform into usable energy inside their cells. In humans, we have a really good understanding of the ways in which we use metabolic fuels for different kinds of exercise. We use two main metabolic fuels to power exercise. Those are fats and carbohydrates. When you're doing really high intensity burst types of exercise, so think sprinting, there your muscles should preferentially use carbohydrates or sugars uh, for fuel. When you're doing things that are submaximal or not your fastest speed, think running a marathon. There, it's more efficient to use fats to power that kind of exercise. The reason that different fuels work best for powering different kinds of activities has to do with a trade-off between how quickly those fuels can be converted to usable energy versus how much energy they contain. We use sugars to power high intensity exercise because they can be converted to energy quickly. Fats take longer to convert into energy, but each gram of fat contains more energy than each gram of sugar. And that's why fats are better for powering endurance type activities. So these trade-offs about what the optimal fuel is for the, a given activity, these hold across most mammal groups, at least, um, at low elevation. 
So knowing that there are two main types of metabolic fuels, carbs and fats, that animals use for energy, we wanted to ask, is there a difference in how highland mice use these fuels compared to lowland mice? Uh, so we're here at University of Montana in the physiology lab, and this is the space that we use to simulate high altitude environments at the tops of mountains. So we have a, a small refrigerator here that we can use to manipulate temperature. We also have uh, an oxygen tank that we can use to simulate the amount of oxygen they would experience at the top of a mountain. Animals use oxygen to transform metabolic fuels like carbohydrates and fats into usable energy, or ATP releasing carbon dioxide, water, and heat. We know that you need different amounts of oxygen to burn a gram of fat versus a gram of carbohydrate. In fact, burning fats requires a lot more oxygen than burning carbohydrates. In this machine, what we're measuring is how much oxygen these animals are using in order to generate the body heat that they need to maintain function. So what you're looking at here, this black line, is the amount of oxygen that a mouse consumes during one of these cold trials. And this is the amount of carbon dioxide that they produce. By comparing the amount of oxygen that's consumed to the amount of carbon dioxide that's produced, we can figure out the metabolic fuels that they're burning. So when a mouse is burning carbohydrate, we expect this ratio to be one. So for every molecule of oxygen they consume, they produce a molecule of carbon dioxide. But when they're burning fat, we expect that ratio to be closer to 0.7. And ratios in between 0.7 and 1 suggest a mixture of, of carbohydrates and fats. And what we found is that the, the Highlanders are fat-burning machines. Under high-altitude conditions that we simulate in these trials, the Highlanders are able to burn fats at much higher rates than the Lowlanders are. Staying warm on these mountaintops is like running a marathon all winter long. And to accomplish this, Highland deer mice have evolved to burn fats at higher rates. But burning fats requires a lot of oxygen, and at high elevation in the mountains, there just isn't that much oxygen available. In an environment where oxygen is scarce, how do they do it? It turns out that millennia of natural selection in this low oxygen environment has led to several adaptations that allow these mice to get more oxygen out of the air and into their cells. One example of this is hemoglobin. So this is the protein in our blood that binds to oxygen. In highland mice, hemoglobin is better able to bind oxygen in the lungs so that their blood can transport more oxygen to the tissues. And this is due to differences in the genes that make that hemoglobin. These genes show strong genetic differences between highland and lowland mice. And those differences are indicative of this history of natural selection. I became a biologist because I think life is a puzzle, right? The way that life finds solutions to all sorts of crazy problems that the world presents to it, you know, that to me is just fascinating. Species around the world have adapted to survive in virtually every environment. In the mountains of North America, deer mice have evolved the ability to take more oxygen out of the air and use it in their cells to burn fat at a higher rate than their lowland relatives in order to stay warm and power their activities in this harsh environment. Understanding exactly what forces have allowed mice to colonize and thrive in these high elevation environments is really fascinating as, a, as an athlete because when you go up to those places, it's painful. There are these times when you're running, you're like, why can't I just bring in more oxygen? Like, I know it's there, I'm just not getting it. And then I think about these mice, and you know that they're able to do it, but also that it's taken thousands, if not millions of years for them to actually become adapted to these environments. And so that also makes me feel a little bit better about myself, because it's like, okay, they didn't do it in just one day. <laughs>